So the claim here is that residents of the town purportedly fled en masse by about 1950 after a number of unsolved murders and disappearances. We're going to get into what these murderous encounters with entities are, what's been claimed now for decades, and whether or not any of this is true. And it is one of the, if not the strangest mystery in Alaska. Very heavy dead trees being turned upside down and stuck into the ground. It's like whistling in the forest. You don't whistle in the forest, especially at night, across the board. It's like people want to paint it with one brush and one brush only, when these things are way more complicated than you can possibly imagine. Of stories and evidence of Bigfoot sightings around the world, some stand out more than others, especially when you get to the mysterious territories in the north, especially when you get to Alaska, a sparsely populated, volatile countryside where the mysteries have passed down for generations verbally and now to its current American inhabitants. There is no stranger account we've come across than the abandoned village of Port Chatham, Alaska, where residents were reportedly chased out by a series of murders which were blamed on a strange beast from the forest. Today, the reports are split from debunkers claiming there is no evidence of the creature to others spending thousands to travel there and hunt what they call the Alaskan Nantanak, a Bigfoot larger, stronger, and more ferocious than any other on the planet. And why wouldn't it be? Not everything can survive in Alaska. Today, we'll be investigating sightings of the strange hairy man of Alaska and whether or not these claims are real, false, or if perhaps the answer lies somewhere in the middle. We're also going to look into a place dubbed Bigfoot Island and some extremely bizarre occurrences of trees that are 1,500 pounds being turned upside down and driven into the ground four feet deep with no evidence of human equipment involved in the phenomena. John, how you doing? Doing good. The Nantanak. Yeah. Great yeah. local name for for the for the beast we all call Bigfoot. Yeah, I know. And it's 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 interesting too because the Nantanak is supposedly much larger than right. our what regular Bigfoot. Um and you get into these stories. I mean it just it doesn't just exist here with within the local lore like you have a lot of i don't know i've run across some youtubers that are presenting stories which i don't know if they're true or not because so much creepy pasta uh, oh yeah no sleep stories show up there that are passed off as being true of like military hunting the bigfoots that are you know 20 feet tall in alaska and stuff like that so i mean I don't know if they're true. I just think they're interesting stories. But then you have the whole old legends of the Nantanak that is much bigger than our Bigfoot. Yeah, I'm hearing eight to 12 feet eight height to 12. There and yeah. four to six feet wide at the shoulders. And now what's strange about that is it's it's we're talking about sizes that are in the culture of the Inuit people that go back hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, six feet wide at the shoulders when you have an eight foot to 12 foot beast is like kind of outrageous. Yeah, it's pretty stocky. <laughs> right. And you know, what's also really interesting is like we have this entire, in our Western culture and our American culture, we have this sort of more academic and scientific approach to determining, you know, the reality or the truth of, of certain claims. But before, Westerners settled, the Inuit people took the Nantanak or the hairy man as just an everyday part of life. There weren't skeptics or debunkers just in understanding that something was out there and it should be respected. Yeah, right. Like all native uh, cultures in the United States, just across the board, even Canada or wherever. I mean, you, you, like you run into the lore across the board with the cultures and it just was, was or it is a part of life. It's just that way. 
but not just that. I mean, you have others, other things that are a part of life for them that they experience, but Westerners don't. You know, before we get into this, you know, this claim of, of Port Chatham or Port Lock kind of being um, abandoned because of these attacks, I guess you could say, I thought it would be good if we kind of went over some actual um, encounters that that we found of people seeing Bigfoot across Alaska in general, right? Now we're talking about personal claims here uh, that we found through various, you can find these online, you can find these in different shows all about Alaska, but Prince of Wales Island, which is America's fourth largest island, this, this island is close to the size of Delaware and the population is only about 6,000 people, right? And so we've got a lot of hunters, a lot of trappers, We've just got like salt of the earth people out there that are seeing things that they can't explain. And when you, you know, it's always helpful. I find more so than in in an article, a lot of times it's more helpful to watch a person tell their experience of what they saw and what they can't explain, because you can kind of garner whether the the person is telling the truth or they're just kind of screwing around. You know what I mean? Right. And then you have that the whole uh, PTSD side. If they had a close personal encounter, that inevitably shows up. I mean, those show up really uh, to a high degree when you get into the uh, dogman interviews. Right. Um, they'll show up occasionally with the Bigfoot ones because the Bigfoot ones seem to be more at a distance um, overall. But then, you know, you've got the ones where now something else bad is happening. And I have to question. I have to, you know, obviously, like when you get to populations of, of humans, there's good humans and then there's bad humans, right? And and you're going to have a mix, likely within Bigfoot populations, but it seems to be a lot less on the 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 harder negative side. Um, but when we get into some of these stories, we find a lot of very negative stuff when we get further up north. It isn't like the Pacific Northwest. I mean, the Pacific, like you'll get. Bigfoot chasing people out of areas. And I've heard tons of stories where Bigfoot has chased people out of areas. That's when you get that PTSD element. And those interviews get very interesting because you can really tell the truth of them through yeah. those, you know, cracked voices and weeping. And breathe, and heavy weeping. breathing, heart racing, just they're yeah. going back to that moment, right? Right, right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the north, is further up you go north, it seems to get a little bit more sinister it's weird too because even with our own animals like the polar bear it's the same thing i mean you've got bears that are like not great down here you mean you go up and find grizzly bears but the polar bears really are just like if you see one you're dead like just hope it doesn't see you there isn't like a oh i'm gonna put my arms up and look like i'm bigger than i am or anything like that it's just you're dead pretty much you know So yeah, so a couple of real quick ones. There was a guy named Walter Frank, who's a hunter. He had big boulders thrown at him while out hunting in a certain area. Now, this is all on Bigfoot Island, which they call the Prince of Wales Island, right? It's been dubbed that by different, um, you know, travel channel uh, shows and things like that, uh, which is a little bit sensational. But like, what are the claims here, right? So another guy named Al Jackson, he's seen groups of Bigfoot And he thinks that these Bigfoot were about 10 feet tall, which is massive. Okay, now then we get into we've got a local trapper and hunter named Bill Musser. He was out hunting with his cousin. He decided to build a trapper's cabin as a base. He heard banging on a tree across from wherever he was. It was very unnerving. They were getting answers when they were pounding on the trees, like when they were replying with, you know, pounding on the trees back at whatever it was that was out there. Bigfoot researchers think the tree knocking is the Bigfoot marking their territory, right? And um, we see similar behavior, you know, documented with gorillas. People investigating the noises have, in some cases, observed Sasquatches. Like, what do you think about this? Because you've seen a lot of this communication going on, I think. Yeah, I mean, I like, honestly, when you get into like heavily researched uh, Bigfoot areas within that community. I think it's just Bigfoot researchers knocking with each other. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I've, yeah, I've heard it. 
I've heard it happen, but it's so hard to tell like what's going on there, um, especially in the areas where you do have a lot of sightings of them in general, supposed sightings, and then you have a lot of researchers going out to them. So uh, when we remote viewed some of the stuff like around the knocking, what straight from Bigfoot, like that turns into a story where it's it's not just like marking territory, it would be less so on marking territory, but more like a, a type of communication, be like calling other Bigfoot like I'm over here, I'm over here, right? Right. Knock back. Where are you? You know, instead of yelling, because the yelling part can be like it can it can lead to somebody finding you. <laughs> the yelling part, right? People won't pay attention to knocks in the wood. Yes, right. And um, among the Bigfoot researchers that are out there that have had shows and stuff, that the ones they go into the woods and they scream at the top of their lungs, like I always, I'm always just like, dude, really. Shut up. Woo! Like you're not right, going to find anything that way. Remember that time. So this is the weird thing. Remember that time we went out, you and I, and I think Ben was there. And we had, yeah. um, I don't remember the woman that was with us, but she was singing. Yes. Yeah, it's we have that. It's like it's like it's like whistling in the forest. You don't whistle in the forest, especially at night. I mean, you sent me this one video earlier of a guy doing tube and throat singing in the forest, and you've got this like head thing popping out to. No, no, you don't make those sounds in the forest. <laughs> you just don't do it. <sighs> one of these shows that I was watching recently of one of these like you know famous Bigfoot researchers of I'm not going to really name. He's in the forest and he's screaming bloody murder at the top of his lungs and then stops and whistles. And I was like, are you the dumbest person in the forest? Seriously, like, don't yeah. do that in the forest. Like, you just don't whistle in the forest. Like, it can do the things you don't want it to do, you know? Right. I mean, the, the Inuit basically say that. They say, do not, especially do not whistle at night in the, in, in the forest. Right. Don't do it. Yeah, and we've we've got like a so there's a couple of other um, accounts here that are that are pretty interesting, more interesting than the last one. So Paul Washington Sr. was working construction. He's flagging roads. He has a female um, empl like employee working with him. Right. He hears something in the woods. He looks over. He sees something like a Sasquatch that's there looking at him. So he he flees really fast and he meets up with his female team member. She looks over, she sees it too, screams at the top of her lungs. And it wasn't one, but it was two Bigfoot approaching. He said the hair was standing up on the back of it, you know, back of his head. And they called it in to their other construction team members who came over and they were just kind of like frantic, right? It's a pretty interesting one because they're like working construction. Now this right. one is the most concrete evidence that we found is a guy named Keith Lindsay, who basically, you know, he lives on Alaska. He does metal detecting as a hobbyist, right? And so one, one particular spring, it was uh, 2012, late April. It was like the shoreline basically was the lowest of all time. So the, the, it, like the water had just gone down really, really far. And he's like, oh, interesting. You know, since the water has come in a lot, maybe I can go in and, and metal detect and see what I find over there. Right. So he goes over there and as he's kind of walking around, he's like, what? these, he sees some footprints and he's like, this can't be right. Right. So he actually documents the footprints and the stride of the footprints. Okay, their size in comparison to the coil at the head of his metal detector. Now, the head of his metal detector is 11 inches long. Okay, he put the metal detector down next to these feet print. And the you can see that these, these footprints are five to six inches longer 
than the metal detector, placing them at around 16 to 18 inches. And the stride of whatever this thing was, you can see it because he has all these photos of it. The stride is like six feet in some cases, like a six right. foot stride. Like you'd have to jump and even then might not make the total distance, right? Okay, so it's, you know, also it's a bare foot. And we're talking about April in Alaska. It's still super cold. No one's going to be walking out. Like you might get that in the summer when it's like 60 degrees or something, you know, but you're definitely not going to get that in April. So who was walking around with bare feet in the snow with a six foot stride, you know, and he videotaped and, and recorded the entire thing. So those are like really interesting, a couple of really interesting sightings just in general on, you know, this, this island. This, so this was this was on Bigfoot Island that that, that construction. Apparently, was. all of, yeah. apparently all of these were on Prince of Wales Islands. Yeah, oh, wow. Prince of Wales okay. Island. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. It's just like a huge community there or something. Why is it that so many people have seemingly have gone out to track this thing and have? Do you think that it's the evidence gets covered up, or do you think that they're unable to track this thing? It's untrackable, or do you think that there's just a lot of like you said, social engineering around this. Well, it's social engineering for the people that <clears throat> don't go into forests that don't do much research. It's that. So they just stay away from it, you know, um, mm -hmm. making fun of people who believe in Bigfoot. I mean, that's, those are the news stories that come out. So look at the news stories on UFOs now compared to what they were in the past. Anytime a UFO story came up on the news, it was mocking derision. Right. Yeah. And, and showing somebody dressed in an alien costume at some festival. Oh, yeah. So they so people could laugh at them. That's how you get it to be socially engineered. So you don't believe it. Like those people are crazy. Bigfoot's done that way. Like when you get into the news, for the most part, Bigfoot is presented that way. This supposedly is video of Florida's elusive skunk ape. There is a local Bigfoot called the skunk ape. Skunk ape. Now the UFO phenomena is not presented that way, right? Now it's like, we're taking this seriously. So there's a major development in the quest to find out the truth about UFOs and what the government really knows. There is a secret meeting we've learned that's gonna happen next week. We gotta take this seriously, right? More so, for sure. Right, right, more so. They're not pushing it down the path of, of those are crazy people, right, at this point. So this is something on a broad level across society that you have to separate from the actual research of it. And then, you know, okay, so I think we should maybe start getting into this discussion here. Yeah. So for everyone watching, we're going to be talking now about the claims of sightings of this creature in Alaska and whether or not the entire town of Port Chatham, also known as Portlock, was it abandoned because of the murderous encounters from an unknown entity coming from the woods the locals call the Nantanak or the Bigfoot? So the claim here is that residents of the town purportedly fled en masse by about 1950 after a number of unsolved murders and disappearances. Did any of these events happen and what really took place in Port Chatham to create a ghost town and a myth that's lasted to this day? Okay, so now we found multiple claims of the town or the village becoming a ghost town or being abandoned because of these these strange mysterious murders we've also found excellent articles i have to say trying to debunk this whole thing and looking at actual evidence okay now the thing is though is just because an article find or somebody attempts to debunk these things and finds evidence that some of these things that other people have claimed haven't happened if even one of those things did happen in the claims, we've still got a mystery going on. And that's what we're finding here. OK, but let's just kind of step back and give a little bit of a uh, overview of Portlock, this place called Port Chatham in general. Now, this village was established by the Royal British Navy Captain Nathaniel Portlock in 1787. OK, it was in unexplored wild part of the country um you know obviously true frontier of america probably only the hardiest i mean we know that only the hardiest would really survive here now around 1900 a fleet of fishing boats was 
was brought in here and a cannery was built and they were taking advantage of the calm waters and the healthy run of salmon coming through there. Port Chatham grew around the cannery and it was quaint, tidy, beautiful setting nestled between the sea uh, and snow covered peaks, right? So by 1921, residents even established a post office. And the story goes that at first, you know, everything was hunky dory in this settlement. And then, you know, you've got the salmon being plentiful, cannery operation is established, a bunch of seasonal workers are coming in, it's bringing in money. Then the first of many strange occurrences starts in 1905, when claims that people from the village were being harassed by a very large animal, which bothered their camps at night. And the work continued in the next season. You know, all the cannery workers came back, but the issue remained and whatever was out there returned as well. Now, Alaska Magazine said, quote, earlier records made by Portlock Cannery Management showed that the site had been vacated once before. The cannery supervisor noted in 1905 that all the native workers evacuated the area because of something in the forest, but they returned to work at the cannery the following year. Now, here's what I think we should kind of cover what John generally found about why this town was evacuated. And then we're going to get into specific, really serious claims of what happened. And we're going to show you crazy evidence that we found that something strange was going on. So, John, what do you think? Were these claims true? When you guys remote viewed, what exactly happened with this village? What did you guys find? Well, I, okay, so the data basically immediately goes toward um, economics when you get right down to it. It's like it literally goes towards economics. And this is like, I think, in the 1950s when it was abandoned, not the 1905 time frame. Sure. Yeah. It was um, about the 1950s. That's right. Yeah. In the 1950s, it, like the data is all around disbursement based on economics and moving to different areas and um, has to do with um, uh, different ways of transport. So mm. whatever transportation they were using before that time frame was good for the economics. And then the transportation situation shifted and changed which made things a little bit different economically in that place. So that's exactly, that's exactly what I found was that, was that, um, you know, that this area is being accessed mostly by boats as right. modern transportation gets more advanced, trains start getting put in, in different places, the boats end up becoming used less. And then it's harder to get around this way. And people just start moving to different areas to find work. Right. 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 So that's, I mean, that's, that's where it went, right? Um, when you get to like the 1905, like why it was abandoned in 1905, um, I didn't look at that. But one thing that I do know is that the native population is going to be, um, they believe in the stories of, of the creatures and Bigfoot more than the white people that would be showing up later. And so I would say in 1905, it would be a little bit more on the side of leaving because there's a scary creatures around, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's like all the stories out there that say that the town was abandoned in the 1950s because of attacks from something creature. That's not why it was abandoned. Right. Um, so there, yeah. but it also doesn't mean that those things didn't happen. Which is it also doesn't interesting. Mean that at all. I mean, see, <laughs> you ask anybody, like, ask one person um, in the town why it was abandoned. They're going to say why they left for one thing, and they're going to attribute that to the most, probably most of the population. Because if there was something chasing them out that was big and scary, that's going to that's going to be their dominant experience. Like, that's worse than economics. Way worse, and yeah. it, it is possible that. 
over like the overarching reason was economics and transportation, but there were people super freaked out and they were like, Hey, the economics and transportation suck anyway. Let's right. go move somewhere else because this other stuff is happening too. Right. Yeah. Which we see a lot in, in personal kind of like verbal storytelling that's being passed around. And that's largely in some of these claims in these articles, but we're going to get into what these murderous encounters with entities are, what's been claimed now for decades and whether or not any of this is true. So you guys got to check this out here. Now, here's an overview of what you can find in most of these articles and what was highlighted in this article attempting to debunk all of this. Okay. A gold miner from nearby Port Graham went off to work and never came back. So missing people were going on. Did you encounter any of that stuff when you yeah. were looking at things? You did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, when we look at um, when we look at some of the incidents that happened there that people claim were uh, of well strange, where where the deaths were attributed to something paranormal or Bigfoot like, there's there is quite a few of those experiences, right? Like we didn't, like some of them are, are mundane and some of them are not mundane. So when you have a town that people think was evacuated because of a hairy monster chasing them out, every single disappearance that occurs in the area is going to be because the big hairy monster did it. But that's not the case when we remote view it. Some of this stuff had to do with murders. Some of this stuff had to do with a bear. Some of this stuff had to do with getting frozen and then washed into a river. I mean, accidents. But then some of this had to do with something else. But across the board, it's like people want to paint it with one brush and one brush only when these things are way more complicated than you can possibly imagine. Wow. So there's just a lot of weird stuff happening in this area. Yeah. And it's not just Bigfoot. So, okay, here's another one. A fisherman named Tom Larson saw a large hairy beast on the beach, went home to get his rifle, but allowed the monster to leave in peace. What do you think? Oh, well, I mean, I'd say that he has uh, probably compassion and also um, understanding that if he shot at that big, huge, massive thing, it would just annoy it. <laughs> right. We don't know which one it is there, but yeah. Uh, more, more, more likely it's that if you shoot at it, you're probably just going to annoy it and it's going to come after you. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's lots of stories of, of, um, people who have been hunting and they shoot a deer and then they'll get tracked and followed by a, some type of creature, whether it be a Bigfoot or a dog man, because one of the things that people think is that Bigfoot will go towards where they hear a gunshot. Uh, in order to try to steal the kill from the hunter. Really? Yeah. Or, or the dog man, whatever it is. Or the dog man, yeah. It's free, hmm. easy food. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's already it's already laid out there for you. Okay, so here, here's, speaking of hunting, here's a claim here. Hunters track tracking a moose found that it had already been tracked by something that left 18-inch human-like footprints, which sound a lot like those claims we heard before from... Um, that guy named Keith Lindsay, the metal detector guy. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Okay. And they soon came across a flattened spot in the brush where they believed the big footed animal killed the moose and carried it away. That's strange. Yeah. 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 I mean, these are like stories. These are stories that are pretty common to tell you the truth when you get into the research. Right. 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 Okay. Now here's, here's a couple of like, we're going to get into some more of the serious ones where we have more information. All right. So one is some cannery workers went up to the hills for a hunt, but never came back later on. One of their bodies horribly mutilated and dismembered washed down the stream into Port Chatham. Some articles multiply this into many mutilated bodies appearing in many different places over a long period of time. Yeah. These, these stories start to get um, crunched together into one big, huge, ball of wax mm -hmm. and and it, like in remote viewing so, like this story for instance you can't really it's hard to tell like what's what um because it gets so the story just gets added to and, and i think a lot of these stories were just added to and added to and added to based off of one thing smaller thing that happened 
Um, but for instance, in this story, uh, th- th- these were the cannery people that went yeah. up. Yeah, cannery um, workers went up to the hills for a hunt, but never came back. Later, one of their bodies, horribly mutilated and dismembered, washed down the stream into Port Chatham. Okay, so this one, this one is is the one where um, we don't necessarily have a Bigfoot. Hmm. Okay, we don't have a Bigfoot in this. What we have is like a sub subject or subjects in the data being um, tracked, followed by something that has a very um, evil, like malicious intent. It was like, it was very strange, evil, but laughing, malicious intent coming, coming after them, which was not, not a Bigfoot. It was something different. And this, this thing was like, um, like bounding them up. Like it would, it was going after them to try to capture them and then bounding them up, like almost like with rope. So this one wasn't, this one wasn't the Bigfoot. This, this one was likely some other thing that comes out of, uh, Inuit legends, like where, because when we look at the Mahaha, very similar data to this thing. Which, yeah, not not a Bigfoot, something that is much darker. And I don't think that all of these stories have to do with Bigfoot in general. I think that people probably attributed them to Bigfoot because that was like the big crashing beast in the forest. When these things were the things that were probably doing most of it in general. Wow, that is crazy. Like this, so Portlock is just way darker than... Well, you do hear like there is one story where I think where the original story came from was from an an Inuit woman who lived um, in that area that said that not only Bigfoot would come in, but this other apparition ghost like female apparition would come in with a white face. And that was something to be very afraid of as well. And so when we look at some of these things some of the data starts to tend towards that description rather than the big hairy creature description. Now there is another, gosh, this is crazy by the way, but another claim here was that a logger named Andrew Comluck was found dead in 1931, killed by an apparent blow to the head from behind, like a blunt force blow that shocked everyone because the amount of, force that would have been needed to, you know, to the back of the head on Andrew was way more than they, they were expecting. Like it was just shocking to them apparently. Right. Right. Well, you ever hear of the Dyatlov pass story, um, and how those people were found with, this is Russia, uh, and a group of hikers were found not mutilated. All their bones were broken. And there was, don't think there was any blood uh, in all of it, but they were found completely crushed, like, like crushed beaten, under, beaten to death, crushed to death, beaten to death, crushed like something, some unknown force, according to the Soviet government said that some unknown force killed them. Um, when we looked at that, what we had there was a Yeti type Sasquatch creature that was annoyed at the experiments, because these 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 uh, people that were hiking were doing these radio sound experiments, where they were sending radio balloons up, and they were really making a lot of ruckus in a territory that didn't actually ever really have much humans, right? And so this thing tracked them and and crushed them basically. So you find the same thing with this logger Andrew, as like with the Dyatlov Pass. Andrew was annoying the Sasquatch based on what he was doing on the logging. Um, was he using machinery or was it just a lot of racket with him pounding? It was a lot of racket. A lot. I don't think he was using machinery, no. But it was just a lot of racket. He might have had some type of machinery there, 1930s machinery. Um, but he was just making a lot of racket and in a place that that Sasquatch didn't want him to be. So if the thing killed him. And like in some of that data, um, we do have that this Sasquatch has or had a taste for crunching bones and flesh of humans, but we didn't necessarily get that this subject was eaten. 
I don't know if he was, um, but we didn't necessarily get it. But this this Sasquatch also seems to have gotten some kind of taste for eating humans. And when we looked at it specifically. Wow. That's... So, we're, so you get a mix, man. You get a big mix, a huge mix of things here, not just one thing. Yeah, but but it's it's paranormal activity, like crazy right. paranormal activity in this area, which is which yeah. is kind of shocking because you know all of these things added up together are causing the abandonment of this town. You know, right? right. Like we've got right. we've got a lot of different things, and, and Alaska just seems to be a very strange land with strange things and creatures and in it that no one can no one can explain well you're you're just looking at massive 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 tracts of empty land i mean right yeah what do we know that's in there we don't know what's there like how can we even presume to understand what develops in in hiding from human eyes when nobody's there right i mean we and and it's it's strange like there are claims of people seeing raptors running around like actual oh yeah right dinosaurs raptors dire wolves like huge bear dogs you know not like the cute ones you see on uh when you do a google search too we're talking about like massive bear dogs that are like almost jurassic in nature um and you know it's easy to say well you know you're up in the in the cold it's just one person seeing this stuff i mean we're talking about multiple sightings of these things and people are having a hard time understanding and grasping what they're looking at, you know? Right. right. So I think, uh, yeah, the mystery of Port Chatham handed right to you there. But there's one other mystery that we need to discuss. And it is one of the, if not the strangest mystery in Alaska. And that is the story or the 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 evidence of trees, very heavy dead trees being turned upside down and stuck into the ground. Now, I found a really interesting a really interesting story here. So you remember earlier I said earlier records made by Portlock Cannery Management they showed that this site had been vacated before that the cannery supervisor noted in 1905 all the native workers evacuated the area because of something in the forest something in the forest uh, but then they returned the next year you know they needed money so they just returned but the stories didn't stop with the abandonment of the village uh, I am quoting Alaska magazine here okay a goat hunter in 1968 claimed to have been chased by a creature while he was hunting in the area. In 1973, three hunters took shelter there during a three-day storm and claimed that each night something walked around their tent on what sounded like only two feet. In 1990, an Anchorage paramedic, now listen to this, in 1990, an Anchorage paramedic was called out to aid a 70-year-old native who had suffered a heart attack but was incarcerated in the Eagle River jail north of the city. While treating the man, the paramedic happened to mention he had hunted in the area of Port Chatham. The elderly man suddenly sat up, grabbed the medic by the shirt, and asked, did it bother you? Did you see it? <laughs> oh, man. So he's like, he grabs him and is probably shaking him. Did you see it? <laughs> now, check this out. There is another name for the Nantanak, apparently, and it's called the Tornet. All right, now listen to this story. This is from, I found this on ADN.com. Every spring, my family and the Panillo clan, a Hawaiian family we're very close to, would pack up and head to Willow for a week to fish for salmon in the Deshka and Susnita River. I might have pronounced that wrong. One particularly rainy and cold spring, my father, brother, and I were pulling in salmon after salmon when a nasty, skunky, musky smell floated towards us. It suddenly dawned on me that most of the other fishing families had quietly and quickly disappeared. Mr. Panillo always fished with a shotgun by his side. My own father was always armed with a Colt 45, and now he unsnapped the holster and quietly told us to reel in our gear and pack up. 
since we'd only been fishing for about an hour and it wasn't anywhere near dark, all of us kids were a little confused, but knowing not to question our dads when they gave us an order, did as we were told. I whispered to my dad asking what was wrong. He whispered back, bear, but I wasn't so sure. I had never smelled a bear like that. As we were crossing over the railroad bridge, I remember looking at some trees that had been uprooted and then stuck in the ground upside down. I often wondered why and how someone could do that. I learned many years later that this was a telltale sign of Bigfoot territory. I guess I'll never know if that was a bear or a Bigfoot that displaced us from fishing that evening, but I do know that was the last time our families ever fished that river. It was also the first and only time all the kids got to sleep or at least try to in the camp trailer instead of the tents. Yeah, that's the that's the structure aspect of Bigfoots where and I've seen those things. Um so yeah, they they'll they'll do stuff like that and the the easy way to tell is if the You're talking about ball, the trees. The, the trees. trees. Yeah, the trees. Like the easy way to tell is when you're out there is to understand how that try to understand how that root ball got out of the ground and got placed in a location that it could not naturally fall. And that's really what it comes down to. So that's how, you know, you're in some kind of Bigfoot territory and, and they'll use those things. Can we, we've remote viewed, you know, some of the so-called structures, Bigfoot structures, they'll use those things to mark off clan, like where clan, they, they live in family clan units. And so they will um, mark off their areas with those things, with those types of things. And I've even been in areas where like big, beautiful, healthy forest, like massive evergreens or pine trees. And in one area in particular, I've seen like a whole ring of trees within a forest that are or were healthy. They were healthy when they were snapped, like snapped at about the 10 foot mark like snapped right and there's like like just they're thrown about so they're almost and like like half of it is just like leaning just to, like, down snap on off like yeah. literally snapped off healthy trees and every all the other trees around it are totally fine and healthy and you look at the tree and there's no disease in it and i've seen a lot of the snap snapped trees as well which is a really curious thing most people will just pass them by and go well yeah it's just it it died and snapped but now, some of these look like they were like purposefully fresh trees that were snapped. Hmm. And that seems to be some kind of sign of power. Like hmm. if you're Bigfoot and you're coming into a new territory um, that these other Bigfoot want to protect, the ones that are protecting it, well, I mean, maybe they could be snapping these massive trees to show how they st strong they are and other Bigfoot get it, right? They go, oh yeah, this one's probably really strong over here. I shouldn't come here. Hmm. You know, what's really, really super strange about these, these trees that have been turned upside down is we're not just talking about, we're talking about a 1500 pound tree that has it, like, that isn't even the craziest part that it's that heavy and it's been turned upside down. The fact that it was pulled out of the yeah. dirt <laughs> right? and you have the full set of, of roots up at the top of the tree, it's been stuck down about four feet into the ground and it's sticking up exactly straight right. with the roots at the top. Right. This is very, very strange. And there's tons and tons of photographic evidence of this. And people think that humans did it, but there's no evidence at all of any kind of human activity that would have caused that. And who would bother? Who would bother bringing the equipment to remote areas in Alaska, to do something like that, yeah. To do something like that. What's the point? Yeah. Why do that? Yeah. Unless no it was, point. there is no point, and there is no, there's absolutely no explanation of that. It has there's to be no something. gain. There's just no gain from that. When you get to like more populated areas in the United States where there are Bigfoot sightings, you will have people go and screw around that know about Bigfoot structures and build things in order to trick other people. So you can't always trust those unless there's something that's extremely heavy that you find out there that's been placed in a weird position. Right. So, yeah. But up in Alaska, no, I mean, it's like, why? Like, why? I mean, most people in Alaska, especially when they're not in the towns, living in the towns or cities there, which are very few, they're in survival mode 
they're not going to be wasting their energy like trying to pile drive a tree upside down into the ground after pulling it out of the ground. They're just not going to do it. Why would you do that? Why would you waste your energy on that when you know you need you need to survive? Use it for getting food, not that stuff. Well, that wraps up this series on Alaska and its strange inhabitants. We hope your mind was as blown as ours, but we want to hear your thoughts. What did you guys think about this episode? Did you want to hear more? Do you think we missed something major that you want us to do a show on? Comment below and let us know what you think. John, thanks so much for being here today, and we hope you guys thought these Alaska episodes were just as out of this world as we did. 